Well, good morning. My name is Joe, and uh, we are doing an adult Sunday school on the book Essential Truths uh, for the Christian Faith by um, uh, R.C. Sproul. This week, our lesson is Lesson 34, Christ, Jesus Christ as Mediator. Okay, and um, next week's lesson <laughs> is... Um, Satan. <laughs> so, lesson 48. <laughs> Satan. So, but this week we have Christ as mediator. Lesson 34. Uh, I am coming to you from uh, Lutz, Florida. Cornerstone Presbyterian Church. If you do not have a church and you're looking for one, uh, we would love to have you. Um, and uh, we do practice uh, PPE and uh, and social distancing. My mask is right over there. I'm only not wear wearing it because I am doing this um, uh, lesson, but I will be putting it on as soon as I leave the podium. Anyway, uh, let me open us in prayer. Um, dear Lord, thank you so much for a wonderful week leading up to today, this Lord's Day, and for us it's also Communion Sunday, um, and we celebrate uh, we look forward to the sermon and this class, and, and Lord, we just ask that you would teach us, you would lead us uh, from your word, and continue to pour out your blessings on Cornerstone Presbyterian Church and those who uh, are here. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Jesus Christ as mediator. Well, what's a mediator before we start? What's a mediator? It's somebody, somebody. Actually, a mediator is actually settles the, uh, the uh, disagreement. Okay, but it's somebody. It's somebody in the middle. Somebody in the middle, right? Somebody between two people. Okay, so uh, Christ as mediator is mediator between us and the Father. Okay. So he mediates um, between us, and hopefully that's what will come out in the lesson. Um, we, in effect, don't go directly to the Father. We go to the Father through Jesus, his Son. Okay? Um, so let's, uh, let's start uh, the lesson. A mediator is a go-between. He is one who stands between two or more persons or groups who are in a dispute and tries to reconcile them. In biblical terms, human beings are described as being at enmity against God. So we're actually against God. We rebel, revolt, and refuse to obey the law of God. As a result, God's wrath is upon us. For this catastrophic situation to be changed or redeemed, it is necessary that we become reconciled to God. To effect our reconciliation, God the Father appointed and sent His Son. And I think last week, last week's lesson was His only begotten Son. That's that's true. His only begotten Son to be our mediator. Christ brings to us nothing less than the divine Majesty of God Himself. He is God incarnate. Okay. The incarnation, God took flesh, he became human, fully God and yet fully human. Yet he took upon himself the human nature and willingly submitted himself to the demands of God's law. Christ did not initiate reconciliation in an attempt to persuade the Father to put aside his wrath. Rather, in the eternal counsel of the Godhead, that's the Trinity, there was complete agreement between the Father and the Son that the Son should come as our mediator. No angel could adequately represent God to us. Only God himself could do that. In the Incarnation, the Son took upon himself human nature in order to accomplish the redemption of Adam's fallen seed. By his perfect obedience, that's Christ's, perfect obedience. Christ satisfied the demands of God's law and merited eternal life for us. 
And that's the part we always forget about is that it wasn't that, that he just went to the, to the cross and died for our sins. It's also he lived, he led a perfect life. By his submission to the atoning death on the cross, he satisfied the demands of God's wrath um, against us. So in other words, God could pour out his wrath on the Son, and that would satisfy him. Uh, once again, we met, mentioned this several weeks ago, that yes, God is, is love, but God is also justice. So it would not have been right for God to simply say, Okay, Adam and Eve, you know, you sinned, but, you know, I forgive you, and that's it. No. There had to be a sacrifice. There had to be uh, a satisfaction. And he's going to say it again in this lesson, but uh, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. And God is the one who made the rule. I didn't make that rule. God made that rule that you have to have shedding of blood. And that's why that he knew that in, in effect when he created us and gave us uh, ability to choose, he, um, he knew that we wouldn't choose him. We're going to choose wrong. And if we choose wrong, then he would have to send his son to come and die for us. Both positively and negatively, Christ satisfied the divine requirements for reconciliation. Positive was leading a perfect life. Negative was taking on the sins of the whole world, of all the elect, past, present, and future. He took on all those sins at the cross. He brought about a new covenant with God for us by his blood and continues daily to intercede for us as our high priest. So he is the perfect high priest. He can't die. Okay. His sacrifice was once for all, and uh, he's up in heaven, and he is the high priest using his own blood, okay? Whereas the high priest in the Jewish tradition uh, used the blood of an animal, okay, a lamb. He used his own blood in order to make this uh, perfect sacrifice. And we get little glimpses of this, uh, glimpses of this in the Bible. Because if you think of, think about Abraham, Abraham was promised one son. Did he get it? Did he get one son? Yeah, he got one son. What was the name of the son? The first of Ishmael. Well, no, I mean the one that God gave him. Isaac. Isaac. Okay. Which, by the way, Isaac means laughter. And uh, um, the mom, the mother laughed. Sarah laughed because she said, "How am I going to become pregnant in my old age?" You know, I mean, today people are afraid to get pregnant over forty. And Sarah was in her eighties or nineties. I don't know which. I, I didn't look it up, but she was old, and she laughed. Okay, and laughter. That's Isaac. That's the name. Okay, um, but he delivered the son. Okay, um, an effective mediator is one who is able to make peace between parties who are in conflict or estranged from each other. This is the role Jesus performed as our perfect mediator. Paul declared that we have peace with God through Christ's work of reconciliation. In Romans uh, 5.1 he says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God throughout our, uh, through our Lord Jesus Christ. The mediating work of Christ is superior to all other mediators. Moses was a mediator of the Old Covenant. He served as God's go-between, be, uh, giving the Israelites the law. But Jesus is superior to Moses, the author of Hebrews declares, and this is Hebrews 3, 3 through 6, for this one has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who built the house has more honor than the house. And Moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant, but Christ was faithful as a son over his own house, 
whose house we are. Okay, so they're saying, in effect, the church is the body of Christ, the church is the bride of Christ, but we are, uh, uh, Peter said this, we are built into a wall, okay, as bricks in a wall. That's us, the church, the members of the church. We are in that wall as bricks in the house. Okay, so, um, so what does that mean? Well, for one thing, it means that when you pray, when I pray, when anyone prays, if they know this, they know that you're not actually praying directly to God the Father. What you're doing is you're praying through the Son. Now, one way we do that is at the end of almost every Protestant prayer, I have to say Protestant, at, all, at the end of almost every Protestant prayer, people say, in Jesus' name, right? Um, why? Well, because Jesus is the mediator. In other words, I pray to the Father, but through Jesus. Okay, and Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God the Father, and I make a prayer, you make a prayer, and what happens is Jesus mediates that prayer. Now, it is true there are other groups who have other views. For example, uh, I, I would still say that the Catholic Church still says that the priest is the mediator. Okay? This was... This was really visually evident before Vatican II. Okay, now I know some of you out there might be Catholics or some of you listening to my voice. Um, and a pre-Vatican II, that's before the 60s, when you went to a Catholic mass, the priest stood facing the altar. Okay, like this. All right, and the altar was back there. And the whole idea, this was this was not just like a meaningless thing. <laughs> when you have rituals, when you make hand signals and gestures, when you use symbols, everything means something. And here's what it meant. It meant that the priest was praying to God, and the people through the priest spoke to God. So it was the priest was the mediator. Okay? Now, whether they, whether they actually change that in their theology, I don't know. I really don't know. Uh, their catechism is this thick. Um, and um, I made an attempt to get through it. I think I got two-thirds of the way through it, but I never was able to finish it all the way. And then I became a Protestant, so it didn't seem to be a point to it, to finish it. I mean, But I guess what I'm trying to say is now, if you go to a Catholic Mass, the priest faces the people. But does that mean they change their idea on mediator? I don't know. I can't speak to that. Um, we have never, in the Protestant uh, 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 tradition, we have never said that the, uh, there's no one mediator but Jesus Christ. He is the mediator. Okay? Um, now, that doesn't mean you can't pray for somebody. There's nothing wrong with interceding, okay? I mean, uh, before we started the service, I, I spoke to Chris about my eye surgery next month, and I said, put me on the prayer list. I want prayer for my eye surgery next month in March. Of course, there's nothing wrong with have, asking people to pray for you. Um, they are not mediating. They're interceding want as many intercessors as you can get okay uh, so anyway uh, that you know that just gives you a little idea of the um, of the gravity and I do believe in prayer and for those who don't understand the reformed faith we have always believed in prayer Calvin who is usually credited as uh, the, the, the father of the uh, uh, reformed movement uh, Calvin uh, wrote books on prayer. Uh, but there are many people who are mistaken and they think because Calvin believed in predestination that somehow he didn't pray. That's not true. Couldn't be any further from the truth. Also, Calvin sent more missionaries onto the mission field as a reformer than any other reformer did. And you might say, why send missionaries if you believe in predestination? No, you, you're misunderstanding. <laughs> 
you can still believe in predestination that God uh, selects people for um, for salvation, and you still want to fill in all the steps. <clears throat> what do I mean by that? Um, what I mean is that God uses your prayers to bring people into the kingdom. He uses my prayers. He uses um, your uh, example, maybe your model. Um, in other words, people might see uh, a couple who go to church and they say, oh, so they go to church, you know? And that fact that they are a role model that might help them. Um, St. Augustine, his mother, uh, um, St. Monica, she prayed for him according to her uh, writings. She prayed for 30 years that he would be converted. And he was. And not only was he converted, he became one of the greatest influences in the Christian faith. His influence theologically lasted at least 800 years. And interestingly, at the Protestant Reformation, both the Catholics and the Protestants quoted from Augustine to make their arguments. So I guess what you, say, what you would say is he's seen as extremely positive and correct in both Catholic and Protestant uh, areas. Um, so what would we say then? That the prayer saved the person? No, but God uses the prayers. God uses the actions. You, you might uh, speak to someone, uh, maybe as casually as in a supermarket, uh, maybe more committed in a, uh, a party or something where you're there a longer time, and you tell them about your faith, and that could plant a seed. And then somebody else comes along, the Bible tells us, and somebody else waters that seed, and so on. And it, it, it's a process. Um, and God uses that whole process. So should we pray even though we believe in predestination? Of course. Should we send missionaries? Of course. Right? People aren't going to get converted if they don't hear the word. So we need to make sure that they hear the word. Um, Okay, a scroll has quite a bit of uh, scripture, one especially pretty long, but let me start with Romans 8, 33 and 34. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? Is it God who justifies? Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died, more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. So he's right there relaying our messages to the Father. And if you have received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then you are praying to the Father through the Son. Also, I should point out that um, uh, that he is uh, he's our mediator, he's our intercessor, uh, but the fact is that we now have access to the throne, and that's what we want. We want access to the throne so that we can pray. 1 Timothy 2, 5. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. That's about as direct as possible that we would want to prove to someone that Christ is our mediator. And here's a smaller passage uh, from Hebrews. Uh, this is Hebrews 7, 20 through 25. And it was not without an oath, for those who formerly became priests were made such without an oath. But this one was made a priest with an oath by the one who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. This makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. The former priests, that's the Levitical priests, the priests from the house of Aaron and so on, were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But uh, he holds his priesthood permanently, Jesus, 
um, because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the utmost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. So the other priests, they died. Okay? And their offerings of animals and so on, even though they were prescribed in the Bible, those offerings are gone. Okay? But the offering that Jesus made is eternal. Okay, and then here's the longer uh, uh, passage from Hebrews. Hebrews 9, 11 through 22. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of um, this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. Isn't that phrase beautiful? Eternal redemption. Don't you want eternal redemption? I know when I was raised Catholic, boy, there was two words I did not want to hear, and that was eternal damnation. Okay? <laughs> That's... And they do teach that. Eternal damnation means you go to hell forever. Okay? There's no hope of salvation out of hell. So here is the counter to that. Eternal redemption. Verse 13. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Verse, 30, verse 15. Therefore, he is mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. For where a will is involved, the death of the one who made it uh, must be established. For a will takes effect only at death, since it is not in force as long as the one who made it is alive. Therefore, not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. For when every commandment of the law had been declared by Moses, and remember, besides the Ten Commandments, remember there were 662 rules that he gave um, the Jewish people? Um, so when every commandment of the law had been declared by Moses to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people saying, this is the blood of the covenant that God commanded for you. And in the same way, he sprinkled with the blood both the tent and all the vessels used in worship. Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Okay? Which you've heard me say, I think, for the past three weeks. Right? That's simply the way it is. And who made that rule? <laughs> Satan? No. Who made that rule? God. God made the rule that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. And sometimes, instead of the word forgiveness, they use the word remission. Okay. All right. Well, Scroll has uh, a summary of this lesson. A mediator works to bring about reconciliation between two estranged parties Okay, here's a quiz. Who are the two estranged parties? Us and God. Okay, how did we become estranged? Was it always like that? Yeah. After the fall. So we go all the way back to Adam and Eve, right? Adam and Eve. So when Adam and Eve were created, there was no separation. In fact, it says that uh, God walked in the cool of the evening with Adam and Eve, right? So in other words, there was no separation. They could see God, they could talk to God, right? All before the fall. 
So the fall is what caused the problem. Okay? Number two. Christ, as the God-man, reconciles us to the Father. Okay? Christ is the God-man. He's fully God and fully man. Christ and the Father are agreed from eternity that Christ should be our mediator. In other words, if we look at this, now I'm probably going to get this wrong here, but let me see. Uh, no? It's this way. Okay, there you go. So, time hasn't begun, and if I'm the Trinity here, so Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right? And I'm looking to create and start, okay? I'm looking at that, and I am saying, if we make man in our image and give him choices so that he can choose up and down, left and right, yes and no, etc., he's going to sin. <laughs> so God didn't want us to be robots. I mean, that would have been the alternative. He could have said, well, we're going to make man in our image, but he can't sin, he can't choose. Well, then they would just be robots. He didn't want robots. And he knew, before he created, he knew that if I give them choices, they're going to make bad choices. And the only way to save them, then, will be my son has to go and die. And if you want to know the true love of God, there it is right there. Knowing that Jesus would have to die on the cross, knowing that, he created us anyway. And not as robots, but he created us with choice. Now, you might uh, be thinking, why is he going out of his way not to use the words free will? Because I don't believe in free will. Okay? I, I believe that a free will means that nothing affects your choices. And I don't believe that. I think that... We come into this world and we have a lot of things that affect our choices. You know, maybe your taste buds affect whether you like a steak, rare or medium or well. Maybe your taste buds determine which flavor of ice cream you like. Maybe cells in your eye determine whether your favorite color is red or blue or what. How do we know? But I guess what I'm trying to say is who's to say that every time you choose there isn't something influencing your choice. So I don't like the phrase free will, and I don't like using it. But choices I'll gladly use. Yes, we have choices. Okay. Um, number three. Christ and the Father are agreed from eternity that Christ should be our mediator. Number four. Christ's work of mediation is superior to prophets, angels, and Moses. Because angels have come and given messages and made proclamations. And certainly God sent prophets. But, and, and Moses was huge uh, in our history of, of uh, salvation and creation. But the fact of the matter is, there is one person above all of them. And that is the Son. He sent the Son. And the Son uh, was a prophet. He was a priest. He was a king. He is now our mediator. He is the high priest. He made a sacrifice once for all. And he's up in heaven right now, mediating everything to the Father. And our access to the throne is through him. So um, his work is superior to anyone else. So I, you know, a moment ago I told you about my eye surgery and I said that, you know, Chris to put me on the prayer list. That doesn't mean I'm not going to pray myself. Of course I am. I'm going to pray to the Father through Jesus that the surgery goes well and that it works. Okay, and that I can start seeing better because I'm not having an easy time of it. Okay, but I guess what I'm trying to say is that um, you're doing that and you're also asking for in earthly intercessor, people that you know are saved. And that you're asking your brothers and sisters in Christ to pray for you. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for being our intercessor. You're perfect. Uh, we couldn't ask for a better intercessor or, or intermediary. Um, God, the Father, is angry. He, uh, he was very displeased 
with uh, Adam and Eve's choice. And uh, because of that, there was a separation between man and God. But you had a plan. You had a plan before you created us that you were going to send your only begotten Son to come to earth, teach in your name, and die for our sins. And all you ask in return, Lord, is that we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. If we can receive Christ as our Lord and Savior, he will vouch for us at the throne. And when we go to judgment after we die, he will say to his father, this is my brother, this is one of mine. Well done, good and faithful servant. And I, I pray all of this in Jesus' name.